I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of Tech Field Day, and we're here in Austin, Texas for Tech Field Day 13. I'm joined today by Robin Systems and a group of invited delegates from around the world. They are to ask questions and participate in the discussion. If you'd like to learn more about what we're doing, go to techfieldday.com, and you can find more videos like this at youtube.com slash techfieldday. Uh, my name is Partha Sitala. I'm Robin CTO, and I have with me Deba Chatterjee. So both of us together will go through our product architecture, our technology, and Deva is actually going to walk us through a live demo using the skull canyons that you see on the table here. Right? So Primal talked about application-defined data center. Right? So I'm going to talk about how you build that and what it actually means to be application-aware at the infrastructure layer. Right? So let's start with first the deployment of Robin software. So we are a pure software play. Uh, the customers basically deploy our software on uh, commodity hardware. And when I say commodity hardware, the hardware that you would normally use today to deploy your big data infrastructure like Hadoop or Cassandra or anything like that, which is two U boxes with some amount of RAM in it and CPU in it and storage in it, direct attached storage. So we, uh, we give the customers flexibility to deploy it using three different form factors. Right? You have on this picture that you can see there is pure compute nodes where you just have a lot of compute and a lot of memory but no storage in it. And you have on the bottom just pure storage node, which has a little bit of compute, a little bit of memory, but a lot more storage, and different types of storage. And then you have this thing called as a converge node. A converge node, of course, is you have a good amount of CPU RAM as well as a good amount of storage. This is something that you would typically use for your Hadoop deployment today. right? Um, so you have these. So you start with this, install Linux, Red Hat CentOS, and then you put Robin software on it. So what the Robin software does is the moment you install on it, install it on uh, these machines, it's going to do device discovery. It's going to find out the characteristics of the machine, the characteristics of the drives. And then it's going to create two logical, what we call as application-defined compute plane, which kind of aggregates all the compute resources on all these nodes, and an application-defined storage plane, which aggregates all the storage that's available in the, on these nodes. Right? And I'll come to why I'm calling out this application-defined in the next slide. Bear with me for a second. Okay, on top of this infrastructure, you would essentially deploy our apps. And those apps are de uh, deployed using containers. And uh, we support both Docker-based applications as well as LXE-based applications. And the reason we do that is, I mean, unlike your microservices and stateless kind of applications, what we have noticed is there are certain classes of enterprise apps which have not been Dockerized. They are very hard to Dockerize. And they require a certain kind of workflow, things like upgrade, which is not a very native thing in Docker. So for those kind of applications, LXE is the ideal platform. So we support both Docker and LXE as first-class citizens on our platform. Right? But at the end of the day, I've been calling out application-defined data center. So it's not about containers. It is about applications. So what we want to give, the experience that you want to give to the, to the user is that they are not concerned about managing or bringing up or shutting down their containers, but they're actually doing everything in the context of an application. When I say everything, bringing up an application, doing all the lifecycle management of the application and so on. Right? So that essentially gives a very simple way to bring up and use these enterprise class data heavy applications. All right? So now let's go into what makes infrastructure application aware. So when we looked at the problem, we said that okay. Everyone, when they, when they want to deploy their apps, how do they start? They basically go to your server admin or your virtualization admin, and you basically ask for server resources. Either you get it in the form of bare metal, or you get it in the form of VMs. Then you might go to your storage guy and say, hey, listen, I want to get some storage LUNs. I need to attach it to my apps, and so on. He might ask you, what kind of characteristics do you want? Is it what kind of media you want, SSD or HDD? What kind of IOPS you want, and so on. Then you would go to your network guy and you would go and say, okay, I want to get a su sufficient amount of network bandwidth and you need to have ports and so on, right? So your application deployment today starts with looking at every infrastructure piece and putting everything together, right? It does not start at application, it starts at infrastructure. So how can we change this? So when you looked, up, looked at the problem, we said, that, okay, how about you make the infrastructure itself application aware? And you do that by building the notion of an application into the core infrastructure components, things like storage, things like networking, things like orchestration. So what is the notion of an application? It could be as simple as an ID that tags different components of an application together. It's an ID that is carried from the container 
the storage, to the network, and so on. Or it could be things like the topology that makes an application. You could have a multi-partition application like a Mongo or Cassandra. And all of those partitions are tagged in such a way that the underlying storage pieces and the networking pieces understand that this is all put together, it forms one application. So the first thing is that, bringing the notion of an application into the infrastructure. Second thing is, I mean, now that you have this, can these infrastructure pieces provide a programmable primitive that can be used to control it in a manner that the application user wants to use, right? So that is the second thing. And finally, the third thing is, you describe the needs of an application in a very easy to understand rules in what we call as an application manifest, right? So three things, one, application notion is pushed into the infrastructure, two, you have primitives that the infrastructure exposes, and three, you have a manifest file that the developer who knows this application very well can write and then unleash this, this manifest onto the infrastructure and then you would have your application up and running, right? Okay, so let's dig a little deeper. What is this manifest, right? So here I have an example of Cassandra manifest and I'm gonna highlight a few things that kind of describe how your infrastructure can look at this and then do certain things with it, right? So the first thing, of course, is start with, by the way, this is a YAML file. We call a manifest file, it's a YAML file, right? And you describe the, the basic stuff of an, about an application, the name, the version, and so on. That's less interesting. The next thing is you describe that this application has multiple roles in it. The more complex an app gets, more data heavy an app is, you would have multiple services that actually form uh, the service, right? Like in the case of Cassandra, you have roles which are member seed roles or member roles. Uh, in the case of Hadoop, you might have things like name nodes, data nodes, edge nodes, zookeeper, what have you. There are many, many things, right? All of that put together is your application. So that's what you would describe here. These are the roles. And then for each role, you would basically say, what is the container image that needs to be used to bring up that, that role, right? And again, this could be Docker. In this case, I show you Docker, but it could very well be Alexi. And then you would ask for certain resources that this role requires, right? The resources could be storage resources, compute resources, and networking resources. But if you notice here, right, I, I just say I need two types of storage volumes, right? I need a commit log based storage volume, which is a Cassandra thing, and I need a data based, a data type of uh, storage volume. I say if one requires SSDs, other require HDDs. I do not say where the storage needs to come from. I do not say how do you carve it out. I do not say what kind of LUNs to create. None of that stuff, right? I just say this is what it needs. I don't even say how many of these things it needs. I just say this is what it needs, okay? And then you can specify certain parameters that you can use to configure the application using environment variables. Of course, this is a very Docker native thing, right? You specify environment variables, they get passed when you spin up the container and so on, right? That's what you put in here. And as you can see in this example, there are values that you could hard code that will be the defaults or you could use variables that will be substituted based on when you bring up the app. Then the next thing is, okay, you have all this, great. You bring up the containers, but that doesn't make an application, right? You bring up two containers, let's say this, right? You bring up seed container, member container. Big deal, right? How do you make this an application? So to make this an application, we provide, as I said, the primitives. The primitives are things like, what, what should the infrastructure do when these containers are brought up? What kind of wiring needs to get done underneath? That is something that we expose as primitives so that if your app is very complex, it can go and do certain things to construct this entire application and bring it up. For simpler applications, it's very straightforward. You don't have to do any of these things, but we provide the flexibility for you to override any of these this, this tasks or these hooks that we talk about, right? Things like post start, post create, post grow, and so on. So where, where's the, um, you're, like this under storage, you're abstracting all of that you know, in the generic, I mean, just in the general terms, right? Where, where is the actual specific logic behind the scenes? Yeah, I'll come to that in the next slide. Okay. I'm just building up the manifest yeah, that talks about the needs of an application, right? And finally, uh, again, data heavy applications are very rarely a single container. They're multiple containers, as I said. And not only are they multiple containers, they have certain strict rules in how these containers need to be deployed on your infrastructure. So take Hadoop, for example, right? You might have Zookeeper, you might have data nodes, and you might have name nodes. One service, one app. I'm oh, sorry, multiple service, one app, right? But Hadoop has this restriction that you cannot put multiple data nodes on the same physical hardware, because if one fails, then pretty much it has taken down multiple data nodes. 
It also has restrictions that your zookeeper and the good practice would be to keep your zookeeper cluster out of where the name nodes are, right? So these are things like what we call as affinity or anti-affinity rules. The other thing could be because you're pushing a lot of data during your MapReduce job, you actually want to co-locate your storage with your compute, right? So that could be another affinity rule. So those are the rules that you could express here, right? And that's what I show here. Now, if you notice this, right, anybody who understands the app can put this together. Because the person who's putting this together does not have to, does not have to be a storage admin. He does not have to be a networking admin. He does not have to be a virtualization admin. He just has to be an admin or someone who is knowledgeable about the application he's deploying. So this is a starting point, right? So this is how you, you express the needs of your application. Now, what happens next? So what would happen is we would, uh, we would take this manifest, I mean, the user would take this manifest, he would upload it into our product, and they show up as what we call as application bundles. Here I show a sample set of bundles here, Oracle, Cassandra, Hortonverse, Kafka, Mongo, a bunch of other bundles that we support, and of course you could customize and put your own thing together as well. So the user would go, click on, let's say in this case he clicks on Oracle. Based on the Oracle manifest file, we'll automatically render uh, this dialog box here that will ask for very specific inputs. Inputs that, again, the application owner or user knows. In this case, a very simple thing would be, oh, the pointer there. simple app name, what do you want to call the app? Trivial. What IP subnet to use? Okay? Because you might, have been, you might have been given a subnet based on a tenant policy or so on, right? Then how many CPU cores you want, how much memory you want, what kind of data volumes you want, what protection you want, and so on. And how, well, this is a single unit application, so we don't ask that question, but if you have a Cassandra or a Hadoop and so on, then you would be, we will also ask things like, how many such instances do you want to start at the same time and wire them all together, right? Again, simple stuff to answer, no specifics about managing this or managing that, just inputs here, right? So once the user gives this input, uh, just goes and says provision the app. And then Robin will basically take this input and we do what is called as a plan generation. And then, then we'll bring up this app in a matter of minutes, like literally in a matter of minutes. And the reason we can do that is because we can look at this and then we can go back to our infrastructure components, a storage component, or networking component, or orchestration component, and then you can program those primitives and say this is how I need you to bring up stuff. Again, this is not just bringing up a container, is being, bringing up multiple containers for a complex apps, wiring them together, ensuring that their affinity, anti-affinity rules are met, right? And then the key thing is, like Premal talked about agility, right? Up and running within minutes. And in fact, Deva is going to show you a demo of a few apps. I mean, very complex apps like even Hadoop and Oracle and things like that. Just even if you are not used it, right? In fact, he did a demo a few days ago where he invited someone from the audience and he said, go provision an Oracle app, and that person had never deployed an Oracle app, and just by clicking a few buttons, he had his first Oracle app running, right? Okay, so what happens under the hood? So this, this is great, I mean, it happens very fast, but what is, what is the magic that we pull under the hood, right? There are four, four, I'm sorry, there are four things here. Number one is we determine, as I said, the right compute resources. That can be based on current utilization of your resources. It can be based on isolation policies that you might have set up, tenant level or whatever, what have you. Uh, again, licensing restrictions is another policy that you can define. For example, Oracle is very strict with its licensing, so you might want to only want to use a certain set of nodes on which you want to deploy Oracle. Whereas for other apps, you could go more wider. The next thing is the storage volumes are allocated. Now, the, not only are the volumes allocated, these volumes are allocated based on certain QoS parameters that the user could specify. So if I just go back here, this picture here says enforce IOPS limits. If you were to slide this bar down, then you would actually see a bunch of IOPS requirements that you can specify, right? And then those will be taken as input, and then we'll figure out which nodes, which disk, which IO scheduling to use to, pull up, to carve out those volumes. Right? The next thing is we use Open vSwitch underneath for doing our own networking. So we program the Open vSwitch so that the IP addresses are plumbed and the nece necessary network wiring is done so the containers can talk to each other. And finally, the optional app-specific hooks are executed at the right places. So if you want to do any app-specific customization, you could do that, okay? Now you might ask, okay, so this is something, it looks like automation, why can't you put all this together 
principle. Number one is you, you can, but it is very laborious because you have to again go and understand each and every infrastructure piece and program it appropriately. Second thing is you have to do this separately for each and every different app. So our idea is that we do this and we provide push pro button provisioning for any type of application. So you would deploy your Oracle the same way you would deploy your Hadoop, the same way you would deploy your Cassandra. So irrespective of the type of app you're using, you would have a single workflow. And we have this culture of DevOps that is becoming very popular, right? Where people want to have a larger team that is deploying and managing multiple apps, right? So this is an ideal solution for that because you don't have to be an expert in any specific app, right? Because the workflow is the same. One single tooling, one single workflow. And again, it's push button. And by the way, this is not talk where we are going to actually show you live demo of all, the, all of these things, right? Across multiple multitude of applications. So the second, we already talked about application where infrastructure wiring is done and meeting all the SLAs, which is the most challenging thing. How, does, how do you make uh, infrastructure understand affinity rules? Right? That's a very key thing, right? Because we do that, we can do all the application aware infrastructure wiring. And finally, users are productive in minutes, right? All right, so any questions so far? Okay, so let me go a little deeper. So I've talked about provisioning. Let's go one step down and then see under the hood, what is happening on the servers, right? So I'll start with this diagram here. So for the sake of simplicity, I have separated storage and compute. But you could, as I said, you could coexist them together, line converge thing. So when you install the Robin software, there are a few components that get installed. The first component is what we call as an RCM and an agent. RCM is a Robin cluster manager. It's pretty much the brains behind everything. And then you have an agent that is a workhorse that basically takes tasks that RCM spins out and then it executes on those things, right? Using the primitives that I talked about. Second thing is we have a storage component. By the way, we have built our own container aware or application aware block, scale out block storage. It's not based off any open source uh, because when we looked at the current available tools out there, we said that it does not meet the needs that we have because we wanted to expose these primitives and we wanted to be very fast and so on, right? So we have the scale out block storage that we, uh, that we deploy. And we have again two components there, a storage manager that acts again as a brain for all the storage related uh, configuration that needs to get done. And RDVM is the Robin distributed volume manager. So this is the one that can very quickly in the matter of milliseconds or seconds spin up several uh, contain so several LUNs or several volumes that are all striped across multiple nodes. And then finally, we have a Robin I.O. manager that runs on all the compute nodes. So this is pretty much all the infrastructure plumbing that we do underneath, right? Um, again, this is all through one script that you install and the discovery and the hookup and everything happens automatically. All right, so, and of course, we have a web, so a web UI as well as a CLI and a REST-based interface to interact with the system. And finally, when you bring up your containers, if you notice here, uh, we show that these containers are writing to their native file systems, whatever they, are, they would be using, let's say ext4 or raw volumes, for example, an Oracle requires raw volumes or XFS, and they write to an underlying block device. So that is the block device that we expose to these applications. And any IO that goes to the block device is then sent to Rio, which is a Robin IO manager, which brokers it so that it goes to the appropriate disk on a particular node, right? Which node to go to, which disk to go to, and all that is determined by the configuration that is generated when you click on that provision application, right? Uh, again, I just want to call out a few things here. Where we attach in the entire I/O stack is way below, way below the application near the block device, and that is one of the reasons why we can provide a common workflow for any type of application, right? Uh, and we let our users run unmodified Docker containers or any LXE containers. For example, Oracle is supported in LXE. You can run it unmodified because we don't touch anything inside. We are in the periphery of things and then we operate that way. 